Clark, uh, really appreciate it. And thanks for asking me to uh, talk to you guys this morning. I was going to try and do something actually out at the site, but connectivity is uh, pretty bad in this area right now, especially out at East Calvary Field. And uh, I, obviously, I'm the most technologically uh, advanced person in trying to figure this stuff out. But uh, East Calvary Field here at Gettysburg, uh, all you guys are very familiar, I know, with that terminology. You're very familiar with uh, probably where it is, located about three miles east of Gettysburg, and is part of um, Gettysburg National Military Park. The significance of East Calvary Field boils down to this on July 3rd, 1863. There's been a lot of, um, I say, false narrative that's arisen lately, and especially in the past 10, 15, 20 some years, about the purpose of Stewart and his Calvary Division and exactly what they're supposed to be doing out there on July 3rd and how this whole action occurred. Um, and without getting into a lot of super controversial detail about this, it, it, it's really very simple. Uh, Stewart and his cavalry division had been uh, flanking the Army of Northern Virginia during its campaign northward into North Virginia. Uh, they did a pretty good job, uh, stopped the Union cavalry probes, especially at Aldi, Middleburg, Upperville, um, and other points. But then Stewart decided to detach himself from the Army of Northern Virginia and rode east and around the Army of the Potomac. Um, whether that was good or bad doesn't really matter now, but the point is that any sort of couriers or information that he was sending back to Lee as to where the location of the Army of the Potomac was never got there. So by late June, Lee is still trying to figure out where the Army of the Potomac is, but more importantly, where is Stuart? Uh, Stuart and his division ride east, across the Potomac, and into Maryland. Now, there's a number of different skirmishes along the way, uh, most notably outside of Rockville. Uh, he captures a federal wagon train of uh, ammunition, uh, uh, rations, everything. Uh, more importantly, there was forage and oats and sell the wagons for the support of the cavalry. And his horses were pretty worn out. Um, one thing about his division was during the winter of 1863, they had been getting minimal rations, minimal hay, oats, and also, for that matter, minimal veterinary care. It was up to most each individual to take care of his mount in his division. Uh, more importantly, the horse artillery that was accompanying Stewart's division, uh, those were basically Confederacy-owned horses. Replacement of earlier horses had been lost from private purchase, and they were not in the best shape either. That was Beckham's artillery battalion, actually about three or four or five batteries. By the time Stewart got into Pennsylvania, though, his, his horses and his men were pretty worn out. He was burdened by this wagon train. He was delayed. He really had no idea where the Army of Northern Virginia was, except for somewhere to the west near the Cashtown Pass or near Chambersburg. So that's where he then tried to get to after the skirmish at Hanover and then northward. Um, there was a subsequent um, pretty sharp action, a little place called Hunterstown, which is about six miles northeast of us. And uh, that is kind of significant in some ways in that it revealed to the federal cavalry where the bulk of Stewart's cavalry division was heading, where they were going. Um, also significant there is this young Brigadier General named George Armstrong Custer almost gets killed. Um, Custer was a captain until June 28th when he's then promoted, promoted to uh, Brigadier General Volunteers and given a command of a brigade of cavalry, the Michigan Brigade, in Kilpatrick's division. Uh, if anything, everyone who's familiar with Custer and know about him, in that he was, if anything, he was bold, um, fearless, and he was also kind of reckless at times. He went through horses like we go through bottles of water. I read at one point that he went through nearly a dozen different mounts during the Gettysburg campaign from beginning to end, and just because they were wounded or he wore them out. And he was kind of a, he was a good horseman, excellent horseman, 
but he was also kind of reckless with his animals, even though he supposedly loved them. Uh, but this was his nemesis here, Jeb Stewart. Uh, as we all know, Stewart was a Virginian, had served in the Western Theater, started out as the first cavalry, uh, first Virginia cavalry colonel, and then within a year was commanding the entire cavalry division of the Army of Northern Virginia. If anything, the guy was brilliant as far as tactics, understanding terrain, uh, figuring out roads where he can move his cavalry very rapidly. But Gettysburg, by this time, his division is not the same as it was in 1861 or 1862. There's been quite a bit of loss as far as battle losses, natural losses, sickness, illness. And he left behind nearly 300 troopers in Virginia when the campaign began because their mounts were dead. They could not get any more mounts. So it was a matter of waiting then for more horses to show up. To give you an idea of where East Cavalry Field here is, it's about three, a little over three miles east of Gettysburg. And if you look real closely, you see this important crossroads right here. There's the Crest Farm, the Rumble Farm lot, several other small farms out here. There's a very large open field. But what is important is indeed this road the uh, uh, Hanover Road that runs eastward, eventually to Hanover, Pennsylvania, and this crossroad here, Low Dutch Road. Now, Low Dutch Road will eventually connect to the York Turnpike and all the way down to a little place called Two Taverns, which is still there today. Um, Two Taverns is a very small village. If anybody's been by it, the Two Taverns, the original homes, are still there. And it was a basically a, a supply point, a, a communications point for the Army of the Potomac. Uh, the entire 12th Corps had rested there on July 1st before advancing to the battlefield that night and early in the morning, July 2nd. What's key out of this is it is in the Union rear. And by July 3rd, Meade's main supply route and communication route had changed from the Tonytown Road to the Baltimore Pike, the Baltimore Pike directly to Westminster, Maryland, eventually Baltimore and Washington. So this line was very, very important for supply, artillery, medical, everything that was coming up came up the Baltimore Pike. Stewart arrives in Gettysburg around noon on July 2nd. And after a very exhausting ride that morning and getting through some close calls at Hunterstown, Hanover and like that, He's hoping General Lee is really happy to see him. And Lee is frustrated because now he shows up while he's in the middle of a pitched battle, um, not understanding specifically how the Army of the Potomac is arrayed beyond the point of the battlefield, the southern part of the battlefield, and where any other reserves may be. And one of Lee's questions, which isn't covered very often, is where is the Federal Cavalry? Stuart has no idea, except they're somewhere to the east. Um, the controversy then will roll on for years and years afterwards. Did, did Stuart fail Lee? And sure he did. Um, there was, through a number of circumstances, a number of, of miscommunications, yeah, he failed Lee. He did not communicate with him properly, communicate with him to know that his messages were delivered. And so Lee was literally blind for about a week before the campaign actually began, or battle actually was fought. So. As Lee now is trying to think of a plan of what to do on the third and the last day of the battle, he has decided to again test the federal flanks. He'll send Ewell's Corps against the right, Longstreet against the left, and hopefully dash the Union line, break it, roll it up again like he had done the day before. But subsequent moves, especially at Culp Hill on the morning July 3rd, threw that plan out the window. Lee will change his strategy and about 10, maybe 10.30 in the morning, this is when he orders General Longstreet to plan for an attack against the Union Center, which will be Pickett's charge. In the meantime, he has talked to Stewart, and his orders to Stewart are directly to take his division, march to the east, to secure the Army's left flank. And while he's out there, if he can find a route into the Union rear, to at least disrupt Union communication, communication and supply routes on the Baltimore Pike. 
and even if possible, roll back or capture any sort of Union refugees from the breakthrough that would be hopefully Pickett's charge. Um, so that, that's basically his mission. Stewart's official report, though, is very confusing. Um, he focuses a lot on trying to get into the Union rear, and I think this is where some of the most recent discussion has come up in that, was he really trying to get in behind the Iron Potomac and in, in concert with Pickett's charge, Pickett's division, then breaking the Union line and roll right in there and scare the Iron Potomac and send them all scattering? Um, that was not his mission. Nobody in their right mind is going to send an understrength cavalry division of about 8,500 effectives into the rear of an army of 75,000 men and thinking that's going to turn the tide. There was a lot of gamble there anyway, whether Longstreet's assault, Pickett's charge, was going to work in the first place. Lee was confident it would, but he did not want to sacrifice his cavalry division and send them into the rear like that. That's, that's ridiculous. Nobody, nobody in the right mind would do that. Uh, others have come about and said, well, that was Lee Lee's plan. Most notably, Thomas Carhart um, in the book, uh, Lee's Real Plan at Gettysburg. Um, a lot of it is based on a former staff officer, Henry McClellan, who served under Stuart and wrote years after the war that, oh, that was our mission, was to go into the Union rear. McClellan was never absolutely uh, specific, as specific what their job was supposed to be, apart from going in behind the Iron Potomac. Yeah, well, well, good luck with that. Um, you know, 20 years afterwards, you can write all sorts of stuff and make it sound believable, and, and no, it's not. So Stewart takes his orders. And a little before noon, he sets out, uh, reinforced with uh, uh, Albert Jenkins' small brigade. Jenkins' brigade had advanced with Ewell's Corps into Pennsylvania, spent most of their time raiding Mechanicsburg, uh, the Harrisburg area, Camp Hill, got a little skirmish up there at Oyster Point, and now I rejoined the Army. Um, Jenkins was wounded, so it was under another commander, but reinforced with Jenkins' brigade, they head east and they cut south and scout this area. The, the scouts were saying that we found Low Dutch Road, we found the connection to two taverns, and Stuart will decide to try and find this small farm, the Rummel Farm, and the Crust Farm. Um, what was significant about this was Stewart, as he got there, saw this large, thick, dense woods called Crest, it's on Crest Ridge. He was gonna hide his division behind those woods and wait for a signal around three, maybe 3.30, then to try his advance. Inexplicably, as he gets there, he orders up a section of one of the Maryland batteries from Beckham's horse artillery just to fire a couple shots off to see if he gets any reaction from Union scouts and Union skirmishers ahead of him. Well, that's like opening the door and say, everyone be quiet. <laughs> uh, Stuart had to know, it's not really clear. He had to know that federal cavalry had been out there the day before and engaged with the second Virginia infantry of the Stonewall Brigade the skirmish along what we call Brinkerhoff's Ridge, which is just about maybe a half of a mile west of East Calvary Battlefield. Greg, David McMurdy Greg, was the division commander out there that day, and uh, Greg was really well aware that there was a large Confederate force on the east side of Gettysburg facing him. Greg's job uh, and David McMurdy Gregg is kind of the underrated uh, cavalry commanders, I think, of the entire war. Eric Wittenberg has often spoke about him. Um, he was a good, solid commander, but there was not a lot of flash to him. Uh, West Point, 1855, pre-war service, primarily in the Western, uh, Western Theater. He came east, uh, was appointed colonel of the 8th Pennsylvania Cavalry. And then within a year, uh, kind of reflected the same way of Stewart's advance, within a year, he's promoted to Brigadier General of Volunteers and given temporary command of an entire division of the Cavalry Corps. He participates in the um, raid during the Chancellorsville campaign, the Stoneman's Raid in Virginia, does a really good, efficient job, and still retains that division command during the Gettysburg campaign. 
uh, his division it only has two small brigades in it. And on July 3rd, he has been ordered to uh, picket the entire Hanover Road, at least past Low Dutch Road, because of the skirmish the day before. And Greg is aware that there is a cavalry force maybe headed east toward him. He gets word from General Alfred Pleasanton. Uh, what what uh, Union observers on East Cemetery Hill see Stewart's column riding eastward around noon or one o'clock, and they send a message to, by signal, eventually to Pleasanton, and Alfred Pleasanton then communicates to Greg, watch out, there might be people coming out on your, on your front. What's really odd about this was Pleasanton also orders him to send Custer's Brigade, which has been out there most of the day, picketing the line, sending Custer's Brigade back to join Kilpatrick's division on the federal left flank at the bottom of this large fish hook line. So Custer packs up his gear, his entire brigade, which was the largest amount of brigades in the entire uh, Cavalry Corps. He heads south down Low Dutch Road to two taverns. And once he gets there, he gets a message from Greg saying, would you please come back? I'd like to just talk to you a little bit. I'm, I'm putting it in modern terms, but Custer returns. He's glad to come back. And Greg and him confer. He says, I know your orders are to join Kilpatrick. Would you remain? Because I believe that there is a very strong force coming towards me. And it's not more than maybe an hour later that these stray artillery shots from Stewart's cavalry, uh, our artillery battery, spread over the field. And they know, well, now the fight's on. The, the cavalry fight is um, it lasts maybe about an hour and a half, a little over two hours. And it starts with a lot of sparring in the field. But I want to point out two officers here, George Armstrong Custer, newly promoted Brigadier General, command of the Michigan Cavalry Brigade. And on his, uh, see with him is Alfred Pleasanton, who is the commander of the uh, Cavalry Corps Army of the Potomac. Pleasanton is kind of ineffective with the cavalry up until July 2nd, the cavalry has been doing a lot of picket duty, guarding roads, escorting uh, supply wagons, uh, everything to the, wa the battlefield. And it's not until the uh, uh, meeting uh, the, at Meade's headquarters on July 2nd that Pleasanton actually starts to take an active role in what he's supposed to do with his cavalry. So he sends uh, Custer to the east, to guard that, to pick at that line along with Greg, then orders him to go south. He's going to use Kilpatrick on the southern end of the field to press the Confederate right flank. That's the higher idea. Custer is more than ready to go. And as a Brigadier General, uh, I don't think you can find a bolder, more impulsive officer than Custer. And he had proven several times before as a lieutenant and later as a captain, he was more than happy to take his mount right up to the very front and lead these gallant charges, which he did at several times, uh, especially at Aldi, uh, Virginia, during the campaign into Northern uh, Virginia and eventually into Maryland and Pennsylvania. So he was probably a good choice and probably a little reckless as well. I wanna take a brief moment here to talk about the two different sides, the A of the Northern Virginia, Army Potomac, the Cavalry Force. The Army of Northern Virginia uh, all these guys were basically raised in small counties, small towns, small areas. They all supplied their own mounts. Many of them were equipped with pre-war cavalry sabers, the very heavy cavalry sabers, um, any other sabers that they could pick up along the way. The majority of them relied on pistols and carbines, small rifles. The average weapon in the uh, uh, Stewart's Cavalry Corps actually was the muzzle-loading, small, short-pattern infield rifle, the little what we call the artillery rifle, or the two-band infield rifle, or also called the artillery rifle, uh, muzzle-loaders. Uh, a lot of them had captured sharps, merrills. Uh, I, I read where several had Smith carbines had been picked up uh, during the campaign. So they used them if they could use the ammunition. And there was Confederate ammunition getting to, for these different calibers, getting to the Army of Northern Virginia Cavalry Corps. But so it was a, a wide array of armament versus the Union side. 
typical Union cavalryman had a Model 1860 light cavalry sable, a Colt pistol, a Colt pistol, a 45, 44 caliber, whatever it was, as well as a Sharps, Merrill, or a um, other unique type of carbine, Smith carbine. There were two regiments out there, most notably that had the more advanced carbines, the Spencer. But in this case, they had Spencer rifles. The entire 5th Michigan Cavalry was outfitted with Smith or with, uh, Spencer carbines or Smith Spencer rifles. The part of the um, 5th Michigan, I think two companies also had Spencer rifles, and they were play a major role in the later action out there in the cavalry battlefield. By the time of Gettysburg, though, I think both of these uh, forces were much more evenly matched than people realize. And that uh, really came about at the Battle of uh, Brandy Station on June 9th, 1863, the precursor to the Gettysburg campaign. As we look at the maps of the field, again, I'm gonna show you just the, the significance of Low Dutch Road, it's tied into the Hanover Road, which was where they had been picketing, federal force had been picketing on July 2nd and again on July 3rd. Custer returns from two taverns, forms his brigade along the Hanover Road, and uh, from here the action opens. Uh, Colonel John McIntosh's brigade is the first one engaged, and it's the first New Jersey cavalry under, well, what's this fellow's name? Uh, Major Myron Beaumont, about six companies are deployed as skirmishers out in the field just south of the Rummel Farm. And the, the monument to the first New Jersey Cavalry is out there along with uh, some of the Maryland, one of the Maryland units, I can't remember if it's Purnell Legion, um, but that's where this cavalry action begins. Stuart sends uh, Jenkins Brigade into the action because they are armed with rifles and short pattern infield rifles. Inexplicably, they are only carrying about 10 to 15 rounds per man. Somebody dropped the ball in resupplying them once they reached Gettysburg and they all came out here with only about 10 rounds or so. So their skirmishing with the first New Jersey doesn't go very well, it didn't last very long. In the meantime, Stewart's, the rest of his division arrives uh, behind Shambliss comes in uh, Hampton Wade's, uh, Wade Hampton's brigade, as well as Fitzhugh Lee's Virginia brigade. Both very large, substantial brigades, and uh, they will, he will use these to really try to force the issue here and push against the Union line and drive them back. Fortuitously, Greg has deployed his cavalry line, not just along the Hanover Road, but with the addition of Custer, he'll deploy some of his men there along Low Dutch Road, and stretching as far north as this point here, which is the 3rd Pennsylvania Battalion of the 3rd Pennsylvania Calendry under William Miller. Uh, Miller will stay there, his orders are to stay there, guard the road, protect the flank of the rest of your line so the, the Confederates don't get around. It's a very simple, simple action. This is the Rummel Farm today. <coughs> The Rummel Farm uh, is privately owned. It's in the middle of the battlefield. There is a scenic easement on it, so they can't make any huge improvements to it, change it, put spires or anything on it. The uh, house itself is the original stone house. The small structure you see in the middle, uh, smoke outhouse, summer kitchen, is also partially original, and the core of the bank barn is original. Some of Jenkins men will occupy these buildings and use them as a reserve as well as their point to fire against the first New Jersey, which is barely about half a mile away or so. The question will come up too about where is the artillery? Beckham's artillery will deploy along Crest Ridge and uh, if anything, they are outgunned by the federal artillery specifically Lieutenant Pennington's Battery M, 2nd U.S. Light Artillery. Uh, Pennington's guns are posted closer to the Hanover Road. Target range is about maybe three quarters of a mile from uh, Hanover Road to Crest Ridge, which you see off there in the distance, that long, that dark line of trees back there, that's Crest Ridge. 
That's where Stuart will concentrate all of his artillery. During the opening duel that begins, uh, Pennington will fire several rounds and literally destroy two of the batteries. Uh, one of his shots is so accurate, it hits the muzzle of an opposing piece, dismounts the gun, wounds two of the gunners. And Pennington, who was watching this, and I, I gotta read Pennington, Penn, Pennington's full name is Lieutenant Alexander Cummings McWhorter Pennington, Jr. That's a heck of a nasty, heck of a uh, mouthpiece. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Pennington watches this, tells his gunners, well done, let's try the piece to the left. They readjust their sights. The next round hits the wheel of that opposing piece, tears the carriage to pieces, kills three of the gunners. That's how accurate the fire is. So it, it, after that, soon after that, Beckham withdraws his batteries back into the woods and the artillery is very truly ineffective. Uh, the cavalry actions will take place after that are really unsupported by Confederate artillery. Now that view you saw was from uh, the height uh, just south of the Rumble Farm towards Crest Ridge. That was the view that Custer will have as he sees the Confederate cavalry eventually advancing. And he advances from this place right here. This is the Joseph Spangler Farm, historic Joseph Spangler Farm on the Hanover Road which is right south of East Calvary Field. Um, this farm was acquired by the National Park Service about 1988 or 89 as a life estate. The house itself is original. The addition on the back is a post-war addition added sometime around 1890 with an addition to that. But there is a summer kitchen to the left side of that, which is original, predates the house. We think all the way back to 1830, 1840. The barn is an original. Um, uh, part of it is the foundation we know is there are parts inside that were changed. We're not exactly sure about the, about the barn. We did find there was a tax record that's saying there were uh, changes to it around 1884, 1885. But the original barn was there at that site and would be used as a field hospital in the aftermath. We believe this was Greg's headquarters. Um, this is where he had the meeting with Custer and several others, McIntosh, as he deployed his troops, because right behind the view of this camera then is uh, where Pennington's battery was located. But the Spangler House is uh, occupied by park staff today. This is how the actual will continue. In the initial charge, uh, Stewart will try to force the issue by sending in uh, Bissu Lee's brigade. Lee's brigade gets halfway across the field about to where uh, just past the normal buildings where he meets a shower of artillery and then Custer will lead the 7th Michigan Cavalry along with part of the 5th Michigan Cavalry into this counter charge against Lee. Uh, there's no progress. There's a whirlwind of fighting, sabers flashing, uh, the whole nine yards, but they draw off pretty quick. Fitzy Lee realizes he's outgunned and outmanned, and with no artillery support, he can't force his way through that line. And the aggressive counterattack, uh, attack, I think, by the 7th Michigan really throws him off. 7th Michigan is a very large regiment, about six to 700 men, all mounted troopers. Custer leads this melee, they withdraw. And then the 5th Michigan adds into it with especially their Spencer rifles, that high rate of fire throw leaves back. Now in this map, it shows uh, these Virginia youths over here to the left, witchers, uh, mostly from, been from Jenkins Brigade. And for the most part, they have no small arms ammunition except for their pistols and their sabers. That's all they've got. So they will also participate in this, try to drive back what's left in the 1st New Jersey, 1st Maryland, 5th Michigan, but they are also repulsed about the same time that Fitzhugh Lee is repulsed. Stewart realizes, as he can hear the guns coming from the direction of Gettysburg, he's running out of time. He wants to try at least get further beyond this, get the Low Dutch Road, get in the Union rear like he thinks he can do so, and withdraw forces from uh, the federal positions there at Gettysburg, but things are, are running short. So he decides again to send everybody in. He'll send in Wade Hampton's brigade along with Fitzhugh brigade and part of Chambliss brigade in this huge charge across the same field. 
which is what you see here in this particular map. Custer has withdrawn the 7th Michigan and uh, pulled them back. As he's regrouping, he sees this another charge coming, which is much larger, more furious, more ferocious. He grabs the 1st Michigan Cavalry, which is right next to him, leads them forward, because come on, you Wolverines, follow me, and they roll right into each other. Um, the clash is so violent that observers can see horses going end over end. That's how violent these two groups splash together out there in the middle of that field. It's hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Some of the most brutal of, of, I think, cavalry fighting, I think of the entire war, except for maybe Trevelyan Station. But this particular monument here, the Greg Chalry, Cavalry Shaft, marks a point where this clash occurred, uh, specifically with the 1st Michigan, Lee, Chambliss, everybody else. And it is a just crazy, it's a melee. Uh, it will go on for almost 30 minutes, these small squads breaking off, individual duels happening. Uh, in, in the middle of all this melee, this little incident occurs here, and I love this painting. It's by Don Troiani. Uh, it shows Wade Hampton, the South Carolinian, the South Carolinian Brigade Commander, in this personal duel with a Michigan trooper. Hampton is a uh, wild guy, uh, solid officer, tall, uh, handsome, brave to a fault. Uh, throughout the entire war, he carries this huge, heavy Prussian saber, and his favorite way to fight the enemy, fight his opponent, was to rise up in his stirrups with both hands and come down with all of his force with that saber on his opponent's head, shoulder, arm. Uh, in one case, he supposedly severed the head of a, of a, op of a opponent on some battlefield in 1862. I don't know if that's true or not. But he was doing this in the middle of this melee, and this Michigan trooper comes up and does the same thing to him. Rises up in his stirrups with his saber, comes down square on Hampton's head just as he's turned to look at him, Lily splits his head open. Hampton gets off the field, and he's bleeding like crazy. They go back to the surgeon. The surgeon, look at the cut, has to shave his head to get to it to try to at least close the wound and stitch it up. So he's got a real headache now for the rest of the campaign. And what's kind of amusing about Hampton, uh, even with his sense of humor, He's the kind of guy you really want to hang out at the campfire with and maybe have a beer or two because he had, he was full of stories and full of life. But he writes his friend on July 16th uh, about the condition. He said, you would laugh as you looked at me because half of my head is shaved and it has given me a real headache. Uh, what really bothers me are the flies that persist buzzing around that bald side of my head. And when I get back to Virginia, one thing I'm going to do is shave the rest of my hair off <laughs> so at least it's all uniform and I don't have this crazy looking half haircut on my head. But uh, Hampton's brigade is repulsed. The South Carolina, South Carolina troops mostly under him. They are repulsed. Lee is repulsed as well as everybody else. Uh, and I, I, I have to apologize. I was trying to do this live. I had a slide of William Miller who was the commander of that uh, 3rd Pennsylvania Battalion on Low Dutch Road, Miller will go against orders. In the middle of this melee, he sees the fighting in front of him through a thin skirt of woods and he decides to lead the battalion in attack out of the woods into the rear of Lee's brigade. It's successful, comes in right at the same time that others now are joining forces. Pennington and the other batteries have turned their guns against the Confederates and they're forced back. And you would think after all this, the losses would be really substantial. And looking at the casualty figures, the heaviest losses are actually in Custer's Brigade, the 1st, the 7th, and part of the 5th Michigan, all lose pretty heavily, up to 200 troopers in one case. The Confederate losses are not that severe, but what is severe is their loss in horses. Uh, nearly 200 horsemen, troopers have been unhorsed and they do not have horses to replace them. So in some cases, uh, as Stewart is trying to re rally his division that night, and they ride back for their next mission, which is now to guard wagon trains and scout everything to the south to prevent 
the Iron Potomac from chasing them into the hills, these guys are riding mules. They're riding large pack animals. They're riding large draft horses. Anything they can get their hands on because they don't want to be left behind. There's a small herd of captured horses, but most of those have been uh, already, they're on their way back to Virginia. So there's no access to those troops, to those horses for these horsemen. So Stewart's division now is gonna struggle quite a bit in the return back to Virginia. Uh, this monument today stands almost directly across the Greg Calvary shaft. This is to the Michigan Calvary Brigade. At the top there's George Armstrong Custer with his hat, hand uh, ceremoniously stuffed in his uh, dress coat as he's looking over the field where the Michiganers fought. This is about the point where the 7th Michigan followed by the 1st Michigan then ran into the Confederate cavalry as they charged trying to break through the Hanover Road. I think what's significant in, in conclusion about this is East Cavalry Field is a somewhat forgotten action here at Gettysburg. Um, a lot of people knew about it. If you've read about the campaign, studied the campaign, you know that uh, East Cavalry Field happened. But exactly what happened out there and how vicious that fight was, is kind of skirted over in a lot of the major histories. It is some of these alternative histories I've mentioned earlier, which um, for the most part are, are just very, very weak um, based on maybe one account, two account. They ignore a lot of the, the realistic things from the official records in that this fight um, was one that Stuart was basically trying to guard that left flank he was ordered to and try to find a way into the Union rear if possible. There's the possibility of it, but that wasn't the primary objective that day. I think Lee himself was so frustrated with Stewart's late arrival on July 2nd that he just frustratingly said, you have to guard the left flank. This is where I've needed you for the past two days of engaged here. I'm gonna need you there tomorrow. That's all open to discussion. What's, what's really unique though about East Calvary Field is this is the, uh, coming of truth for a lot of officers, a lot of enlisted men out there, and especially David McMurdy Gregg. I don't think he gets, again, enough attention for his service during the American Civil War and afterward. This particular photograph, I love this, was taken during the dedication of the Gregg Calvary Shaft uh, in 1884, which you see there in the background, along what is now was at the time Gregg Avenue. The avenue does not exist anymore. It never really was a formal avenue. It was one where they could take their, veterans could take their little carriages out right around the monument and come back to the uh, main Calvary Road. But standing there in the foreground in the tall top hat is indeed David McMurdy Gregg, along with his comrades of the GAR. And it was a very rainy day that day. As you can see to the left, there's quite a bit of water in the ditch and quite a bit of mud all around these poor guys, but they still dedicated that monument in 1884. And it is one of the earliest monuments out there on East Calvary Battlefield. Uh, we are fortunate in that the majority of the um, structures in some of the important farms still exist, even though they are in private hands, except for the Spangler Farm. The Rumble Farm has been protected by the people that live there. They really love the history, enjoy the history of it. The Lot Farm, uh, which is another farm just to the east of the Michigan Brigade Monument, still exists. The house is original, but the other structures are, are long gone. Um, there are efforts out there by the American Battlefield Trust and others to secure more property around it because there is construction going on, even as we speak. Two new homes have gone in, one right against, uh, right along Lodash Road, another right adjacent to the Spanger Farm. And there are plans down the road for more construction out there, probably private homes, um, the home complex just on the east side of the field, which granted is going to take away some of the view shed. It's not on actual battlefield site, but it does take away the view shed that you would have if you stand up there to look around the field and get a panorama from the Greg Calvary shaft as well from the uh, Custom Brigade Monument. So the result of East Calvary Field is as some people call it a draw. I think not so much. I think Stuart got a real bloody nose out there thanks to primarily the action of one man, that's George Armstrong Custer. And unfortunately, 
everybody remembers Custer for the debacle at Little Bighorn. If anything, Custer should be remembered for a lot of the things he did during the Civil War, which was as a hell of a uh, mounted trooper leader, a cavalry leader. Uh, up to this point, the old slogan was, as we all know, infantry, you never see a dead cavalryman. Uh, anybody in the Gettysburg campaign saw a lot of them on many different fields, and there were a lot of them right here at the site of the Great Calvary Shaft, East Calvary Field near Gettysburg. Uh, hey, thanks, thanks for your patience, guys, and I'm sorry this is kind of thrown together at the last minute. I should have known better. But uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, I'll try and answer them for you. Hey, well, thank, thanks, John, and um, I think uh, there are a number of questions. So I'll let uh, them go. Go ahead, Brandon Kelly. Um, the first painting that you showed when um, Custer and Stewart were leading their charges, were they actually up front during the charge? Like in this yes. painting here? Th this particular one here? Yes. Yes, Custer was right in front of the line. Uh, Stewart, Stewart was never out in the field. He was out behind Crest Ridge trying to direct the troops there. That's where he did most of his observations. But Stewart never had physically went out in the field in any of these charges. But the guys that did go out, Hampton, Fitzhugh Lee, uh, Shambliss, uh, a few others, uh, they did not lead from out front. So this is really an artistic impression of some fancy guy in a Confederate uniform leading the charge. It could be a colonel, captain, whatever. Um, and I have to confess, I, I worked with Ward Kunstler on this particular illustration years and years ago. I said to him at that time that, um, Custer was out front. I gave him the information about Custer's uniform, what the first, what the Michigan troopers were carrying, all that stuff. Uh, he just said, well, no one would believe it if you don't have some fancy Confederate officer out there with the plume in his hat leading the charge. Uh, and I said, well, just don't make it Stuart, whatever you do. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought that the, with the plume, I thought that was Stuart, so I wasn't sure. Uh, Stuart was back again, back on Crest Ridge, kind of smoking and joking with his staff. Okay. I think probably scratched his beard wondering what the heck is going on out there. Chip, go ahead. Hi, John. Quick question. You always yeah. hear about Stuart, you know, failing Lee. After the battle, was there any repercussions for that? Did you know other officers blame Stewart? Um, obviously, he died a year later, but um, it wasn't know, really what was he after, after the that? war? That, that's an excellent question, Chip. Uh, when did the finger pointing start? Um, th there was some consternation in Confederate circles after the campaign had ended as to exactly what Stewart's role was, did he drop the ball, did he fail, which I, I think he did. Um, but most of the discussion was kept out of the public circles. It's after the war, after 1865-66, when the lost cause is now raising its somewhat ugly head to try to justify all the losses, all the failures of, of the Confederate forces in the Army of Northern Virginia, any army, but that Stewart then somewhat relegates the point of, well, what the heck was he doing in this campaign not doing his job? Uh, and that's when also finger pointing was going back and forth about James Longstreet, uh, many others. But right, I think the most significant thing is right after the end of the campaign, some of the most dramatic changes really occur in the infantry corps rather than the cavalry corps. Stewart will retain his command He's not chided for anything or not questioned by anybody. I think Lee is very, very lenient, maybe a little over lenient with Stewart. Um, and I do think because he, he adored Stewart. I, I really think Lee had all the respect in the world for Stewart, what he had done with his scratch force of Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina troopers, throwing them together, this big mass, the way he led them. And it's, in some cases, sure, he had which are 35th Virginia Cavalry Battalion, which are kind of like the Hell's Angels of the Cavalry Division. Uh, very hard to control. Uh, Albert Jenkins' group, which was Jenkins himself. Uh, and Jenkins occupied himself during the first part of the campaign, rounding up three and one runaway blacks, uh, 
displaced African Americans in Pennsylvania and shipping them back. So that actually stripped away some of the resources that Lee could have used, Stewart could have used, next to for July 2nd, 3rd. Uh, but again, I think the real controversy comes in the 1870s, again, the 1880s, as they're throwing things back around as to who was at fault for the loss of the Gettysburg campaign. And nobody but nobody wanted to say what it was Lee. Colonel Downs, you had a question? No, actually, John answered it because I was going to say, didn't Lee have other resources? But John pretty much answered that question. Other cavalry resources to use. But I guess he just kept, couldn't believe that Stuart would let him down. He kept expecting him to show up every day. But then John answered the other question. They were on other assignments. I think uh, Mac, uh, not Macintosh, but uh, <coughs> there's two other three other cavalry units that show up, and I'm uh, Imboden's command. Um, they arrive late in the battlefield, and they wind up escorting the wounded wagon, wagon full of wounded, back to Virginia. They have no real role apart from uh, taking over some, guarding some fellow prisoners in the wagon trains back to Virginia. Uh, I think there's just a total failure on the way, the cohesiveness of the cavalry during the army, of, during the campaign army of the Northern Virginia Cavalry, that fails, that totally fails. Um, and the, the, the most critical aspect really comes from infantry officers, especially guys like Longstreet, uh, Earl, Jubal Early, and even a few others that they, they kind of scratch their heads and like, if you were supposed to be here giving this information, be that as it may, but I go to a long discussion. I think Lee's biggest disappointment was not getting those daily dispatches or that information from Stuart as to where the Army of Potomac is during the early part of this campaign throughout June. Lee had no idea the Army of Potomac was concentrated around Frederick until June 28th. And that's when he did orders to bring in all these forces. We've got to concentrate at Cashtown, guard the pass, we'll use that as our defensive line or also offensive line. And Stuart's nowhere to be found. Paul Martinello, you can go, and Brandon, when, when that question is answered, you can jump in with your next one. Uh, hi, John, thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, kind of a first question. Were more horses wounded or killed at East Cavalry Field? And if uh, of those that were killed, was there a large pit that's known to be uh, located where they may have piled them and burned the uh, the killed horses? I, Paul, I think the majority of the horses that were wounded uh, were left behind. I know there was a herd of wounded horses taken back by dismounted troopers to two taverns, uh, July 4th and July 5th. That's where the veterinarians were working. Um, one of the veterinarians, I remember there's an account, and I believe that I, I believe it was attached to the 1st Michigan or the 5th Michigan. He was actually up on the battlefield the day after treating some of these wounded horses. The, the number I heard, and I've never been able to substantiate this, Tom Holbrook may know, was around 200 horses were killed or had to be destroyed. Uh, from the fighting as they were on July 3rd. Those that were killed on the field were stripped of their equipment and the carcasses left behind. As late as uh, three weeks later, there's still horse carcasses laying out there. They didn't bury them. Uh, if anything, the farmers finally just dragged them into piles and tried to burn them all. Where these burn sites were specifically, we've never done enough archaeology out there to know. And I don't think you'd find anything without a lot of looking. Thank you, Brandon. John. Brandon Kelly, you're up, and then uh, Parvis. Hi, John. Um, I had a question. I arrived during the middle of the presentation, so I'm not sure if it was covered earlier. But um, I was curious about, with Lee having so much trust in Stuart, and then with Stuart not responding, like, um, did Stuart ever say what his reasons were for not keeping in communication with Lee and the rest of the Army in Northern Virginia? No. No, he never defended himself. <clears throat> his, his official records are just kind of confusing. Um, his final report and his communications in Volume 3 are, are just kind of scattered haphazard. I think he tried to defend himself for the I sent couriers 
I sent messages to you, General Lee, and well, the couriers never got there. Um, so if you did send couriers, they were either captured or killed along the way, but there's no record of what was in these dispatches that Stewart supposedly sent. I think in the moment, especially after capturing that wagon train um, near Rockville, that he was so far away from Young Northern Virginia, not really knowing where Young Northern Virginia is, except for somewhere to the west of him, that if he sent a dispatch rider to try and find them, it would have taken them three or four days to get there, and then it was too late. Uh, there's so much going on, because he knows there's federal cavalry ahead of him, he thinks militia, which he's going to just drive away, but actually is part of the cavalry force of the Army of Potomac pursuing him. And that's how, in a roundabout way, the Battle of Hanover happened. Kilpatrick's division shows up in Hanover. They ran around scratching their heads and wondering what's going on, and they're just going to ride on. And all of a sudden, Stewart's division shows up behind them as shells and attacks and captures half of Kilpatrick's wagons. It's just it's crazy. It's chaos. Uh, so I don't think Stewart really was able to ever to defend himself um, or never really was caused, called on the carpet to defend himself with anybody. It's one of these things Lee just kind of shuffled it under the rug. Okay. Uh, thanks. I was always I curious about that because like in the movie, like you said, uh, General Lee, there were reasons, but he never said what they were. Yeah, I, I had to make a pit stop or something. <laughs> I don't, don't rely on the dialogue in the movie for anything. Um, I think Stuart was was glad to be there to see Lee, but the kind of, there's several versions of this confrontation. Some say that oh Lee welcomed Stuart, grabbed him, shook, oh it's good, so good to see you. Where the account comes later from uh, Mumford that no Lee was very cold. Mumford was there and related to someone else that no, Lee was very cold to Stuart and said those wagons are an impediment to me now. Basically, what do you want me to do with them? Uh, I'm involved in the middle of a battle here, trying to figure out how to drive the Army Potomac out, trying to figure out how to knock that position out, crack that thing up there, and you're not right, joyriding with a bunch of wagons. Well, thanks. Yeah. What, what are the wagons going to do for me? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, Lee was frustrated. We have to look at Lee's physical health and I think all of his psyche during this campaign, in that uh, he wasn't feeling the greatest. But there are other good thing, issues going on with Lee, and the pressure on him was un, uh, undeniably heavy. Uh, I don't think anybody could take on a campaign in Northern Territory. You're throwing all your chips out there. You got to find the federal army, draw them into a battle, and Lee only has enough ordnance supplies to last no more than a three-day pitched battle. That's all he's got. Uh, we found that in the ordnance wagons, there's around approximately 300 rounds of ammunition per infantryman. You think, well, that's a lot, but not really. In an infantry fire, as we all know, you get engaged in something, you can go through a cartridge box in 45 minutes or less if you're really heavily engaged. And that's not just ordnance. It's also all the other things that comes along with it, uh, artillery. Shell, extra shell, extra ammunition. Uh, and one thing that they were short of by the morning of July 3rd, and there was a warning going out to at least some of the batteries that, you know, really be careful with your ammunition because we're running short of long range ammunition. The supply wagons still had not arrived from Fayetteville. Uh, as far as Beckham's artillery, the horse artillery, they were still carrying uh, partly empty chests from when they began the ride around. Uh, uh, the Army of Potomac. So what Beckham goes out there with is some long-range ammunition, shell, shot, and actually canister rounds. But that ammunition is twofold, just as bad as some of the uh, ammunition issued to the infantry unit. So Beckham has his own issues with poor shells, poor made shells, bad fuses. I'm sorry, I'm going on here, but I, I hope that kind of helps. Oh, it's fine. Yeah, that, that's um, very interesting. So I was curious about like um, what happened. I never knew that before about the wagons. So that's yeah. uh, very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Barbas, did you have a question? Paul Barbas? Yeah. Yes, I think John answered it about archaeology. Not much okay. has done has been done out on East Cavalry Field. Is there 
do you, John, do you see any, any archaeological endeavor in the future? I would hope. <laughs> I hope. You would hope, yeah. Um, <laughs> we would all hope. All right, thank you. With these the problem with East Calvary Field, it's in, been in private hands for years and years and years. The only avenues through there are where War Department avenues put in for the veterans to come out and visit their monuments to mark the site. And since that time, not up until the 1960s, 70s, actually, large swaths of that area had been purchased. So what was out there was field, uh, fields were constantly tilled, turned over the, the small um, mobile home park that's out there, cover significant parts of the field. Uh, I don't see any sort of archaeology taking place out there for years and years and years because it's so expensive. Yeah. If and you can't just do it without justifying a project. Yeah. If, what they're if, doing if, now at, at Colt Hill and what they're doing uh, at Little Round Top, the Valley of Death area, uh, they're able to justify an archaeological survey out there with metal detectors and other things, but uh, and again, it's kind of locate significant sites. Even trying to find an orchard site is tough enough. Right. It's so expensive, and there's just not a lot of money to spend. If if land is being developed, is is there a protocol that archaeological uh, searches go on prior to bulldozers coming in? No, there is not. Okay. Hmm. No, not not in these particular zones. Okay. And it's up to the state uh, office. Uh, um, part of the Department of Environment Resources, the historic, I can't, the office name slips on mine right now, but uh, anytime there's any sort of significant underground action, archaeological action, structures, whatever it be at, on the park itself to take place, we have to go through the Department of DER to get clearance from them. In some of these cases, areas out there that are zoned non-historic, even if they're right next to Low Dutch Road or right next to the battlefield, they don't have to do any surveys at all. I hope that answers the question there. So. I, I, I'm not so sure we should be. Sorry, John, didn't mean to interrupt. Didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. Development out there, but uh, I, I really hope that it can be kind of curtailed and, and pushed elsewhere. I live on the west side of Gettysburg right now, and there's two huge developments out here going in. I, I counted one, there'll be at least 180 homes and townhomes going in, and that's going to significantly impact the area of Low Dutch Road, Old Mill Road, where Hood's division encamped on the night of uh, July 1st. So that's, I think that's in some ways sadder and more sig significant a loss. Mark McNerney, you had a question? Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, John, uh, John, how can you uh, obtain a copy of that, uh, that map that you had up on the screen? I know we got it on the screen, but if you could have a, a paper one you could walk around the battlefield with. This particular one? Yes, right there. It, it, Mark, go online to the uh, American Battle Trust, American okay. Battle Trust site. You can download all these maps. Uh, if you Google East Calvary Field at Gettysburg, it will come up. Sometimes a smaller version. Uh, there are maps at the Library of Congress site of uh, the War Department maps and the early park maps that you can find. If you go to the Library of Congress, Civil War maps, or just Google that, it will come up. And you can download those, and those, everything from small JPEGs to high-resolution TIFFs. Um, so, so I, Mark, if you go to uh, American Battle Trust site, you'll find those maps. They're there. Great, Great John. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Warren. Right, thank you. Hi, great, great talk. Um, are thank there you. any personnel available to give uh, tours over on East Cavalry Field? As far as park staff, it's hard for me to say right now. I, I, I retired a year ago, and um, I, I'd love to take you guys out there. <laughs> if when the pandemic is over and we all have our shots and all that's taken care of, um, next time we get together, I'll be glad to take you guys out there to East Calvary Field or anywhere on the battlefield. 
anywhere you want to go. Um, just just name the time so I can plan ahead. But uh, right now, to, if you want a specific tour of East Calvary Field, there are people like Tom Holbrook. Uh, Tom knows a heck of a lot about the Calvary fight out there. Uh, I don't know if you could spare the time to take you out there to, to go around the field. Tom would be a good one to go with. Uh, there are licensed battlefield guides to contact the guide service that you could contract with to take you out there. Um, there's several that are, I'm trying to think of who, John Beeling was one. Uh, one of the guides has a Spencer rifle that, it's a relic rifle that actually came out of a barn on East Calvary Field. Uh, several years ago, this guy was clearing out this old barn of his and saw this crazy thing stuck in the wall, pulled it out, and here's a Spencer rifle. Oh. So it's either one from the 7th Michigan or the 5th Michigan. Who knows? And he showed it to me, and he was proud of it, and I said, John, that thing's really rusty. I'll give you 50 bucks for it, take it off your hand. You don't, you don't want that hammer. <laughs> uh, uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't bite. Um, but I, there's, there's several licensed guides that would be good to contact. You, know, you have to pay for their service. Sure. It, it, it'd be worthwhile if you want to do that. Well, I, I think, gentlemen, I think Mark and I would split that, wouldn't we, Mark? <laughs> gentlemen, sure. gentlemen, just so you know, this is Ted. Um, this was, if, if we had the in-person school, John would have taken us out on the field, weather permitting or not. Yeah. So this was, uh, this was meant to be a, this was meant to be a, um, a, 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 a battlefield tour. Um, but like, I, I'm going to start adding those every year now, hopefully, to uh, our school. And we can get different folks. John obviously did one that was very successful uh, last year, and 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 this one uh, this year. So um, got canceled obviously because of COVID. So um, are there any more questions? Okay. Well, hearing none, uh, John, as always, thank you very much. This was awesome. Um, I Thanks, know. Guys. I know that uh, this would this would have been better. Had we, had we been able to walk around with you and, and see the field. Um, I'm fortunately gonna, actually going to be in the vicinity of East Calvary Field in about an hour, so I'm going to go and, and drive through anyway on my way to my mother-in-law's house in Hanover, so um, I'll get to see that. Okay. Um, but um, thank you very much for joining us. This was an excellent presentation. Um, thank and again, you. Uh, hopefully we can, we can call back uh, on you for subsequent uh, schools so that we can have you know, similar uh, discussions about the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, I, I appreciate that, Ted. I, I have to say, too, I, since I've kind of retired from reenacting uh, a couple years ago, I can't tell you how much I miss the National Regiment. Uh, I miss everybody. Uh, you guys have been the best. Thanks so much. Absolutely.